Dr. Christopher Thompson from Boston, Massachusetts. And I'd like to thank course organizers and Drs. Diogo Mora and Mohamed al for the kind invitation to speak at this year's conference. Would have been nice to visit Egypt and hopefully we can get together in person sometime soon. The title of my talk is Primary and Illuminal Techniques for Weight Loss. Here are my disclosures. Endoscopic Bariatric and Metabolic Therapies, or EBMTs, can be broadly classified into two categories. Gastric devices, including spaced occupying devices, such as intergastric balloons, uh, gastric modeling procedures, including suturing and plication, and uh, various outlet obstruction and aspiration uh, therapy type devices. And these are thought to initiate weight loss primarily, and then may have secondary effects on comorbidities. The other category are small bowel devices. These include uh, liners that, that co cover the small bowel, duodenal mucosal resurfacing, anastomotic devices and flow altering devices. And these are thought to have direct metabolic effects with less weight loss. And uh, several of these gastric devices are approved by the FDA and are in current uh, use in the United States where the small bowel devices are in clinical trials uh, throughout the world. And we'll start with intragastric balloons or space occupying devices and there's several different types. There are gas-filled balloons, fluid-filled balloons, uh, balloons that really are proceduralist, adjustable balloons, and these were already nicely covered by BARA. Moving on to gastric remodeling, and this is really where I spent most of my time uh, doing procedures. We patented the concept of intragastric suturing for the treatment of obesity in 2003 at the Brigham. We use it to close fistulas, revise gastric bypass uh, surgeries, and uh, for primary obesity therapy. And there's two ways you can do this. One was really recreating a vertical banded gastroplasty, which was uh, the vertical Fogel approach. And then the approach we had been working on was really trying to recreate a gastric imbrication procedure. This is one of our early studies back in 2008, looking at this, uh, this approach, which uh, this evolved into ESG. It's a very similar pattern using running sutures along the greater curvature. And we worked together with the Cleveland Clinic group on this, including Stacey Brethauer and Phil Shower. And we prospectively evaluated 18 patients here, and they had a 27.7% excess weight loss across the board, 30% excess weight loss for those in the lower BMI categories. Um, they had other you know, improvements in waist circumference and blood pressure. However, this was a suction-based suturing device. It wasn't full thickness, and the majority of plications had fallen out at one year, and uh, there were no other complications, but the company decided not to pursue this therapy. We then in 2012 had access to a full thickness suturing device. And here you can see myself and Rob Hawes doing the first in man ESG cases and we performed these in India. Uh, and we did one of the cases live at Endocon actually. And you can see the suturing pattern very similar to that trim procedure which we developed with the other device. Again, uh, suturing down the greater curvature. We broadened this experience to 126 patients for the first in man study across several areas, including India, Panama, and the Dominican Republic. The BMI decreased from about 36.2 down to uh, you know, 29.8. And you can see here about a 20% total weight loss. So this was very encouraging, much better than we saw with the partial thickness suturing device. Others, of course, have studied this extensively. This is from Reem Sharaya's group. She studied 91 patients in a prospective series. Um, and you can see here, uh, percent total weight loss of uh, nearly 21 at 24 months, SCE rate of 1.1% with a perigastric leak. And what was interesting here is she was the first to really look at these comorbidities. And you see an uh, improvement in HbA1c by a point in those uh, patients that were pre-diabetic, diabetic, improvement in blood pressure, triglycerides, and liver tests. She also did another study, 216 patients with five-year outcomes. Uh, and you can see here, uh, baseline BMI was, BMI was 39. Uh, uh, 203 patients had one year follow up, only 68 patients were eligible for five year follow up. Uh, and you can see follow up rates were quite good at 82% in five years. And uh, the weight loss was 15.9%, which is very admirable, especially compared to what we were seeing with balloons. 90% uh, maintained 5% total weight loss. 
and 61% maintained at least 10% total weight loss. That's fantastic. Um, if you keep in mind that average weight loss with a balloon at one year is, uh, is 11%. So 27% uh, were started on pharmacotherapy after ESG, which is a relatively small portion. And the moderate average event rate was again seen in 1.3% of patients with no uh, severe or fatal adverse events. Several endoscopic suturing patterns have been investigated. Uh, so far, what we've been talking about has been the triangle or double triangle pattern. Uh, it does reduce both the width and length of the stomach, but there are some drawbacks to it um, regarding uh, tension on particular sutures. Uh, now, what's more commonly being uh, utilized is the U-stitch, where we start on the anterior surface of the stomach, run along the greater curvature, and then on the posterior stomach, we run proximally and then make our way back up to the anterior surface. And then we'd um, reinforce that with an interrupted stitch anterior to posterior or a short running suture called an I. Uh, so we alternate U, I, U, I. And um, this has become more common. This is a study looking at that new suturing pattern. It's a multicenter international retrospective uh, study that we participated in as well as uh, six other sites in, uh, in South America. And these other sites had varying experience. So it was interesting to look at uh, differences in outcomes between a very experienced sites such as ours and newer sites that are just picking it up. And again, we use the U-stitch, uh, four to six sutures. And the results are here, 15% uh, total weight loss at 12 months. This was uniform across centers, uh, irrespective of experience. Uh, predictions of success were interesting here, uh, age less than 41, male sex, and higher BMI, which was really the first time we're noticing this. You know, the higher the BMI, the more weight is lost. So quite interesting. And again, that SAE rate is still 1.03% with some perigastric leaks. Um, th these uh, did require surgery, but again, uh, lots of centers on the learning curve and uh, very consistent results. This is a 1,000 patient prospective series out of Riyadh, uh, Professor al -Qatani. And you can see a baseline BMI here, a little lower, 33. And you can see efficacy again, uh, over 15% here um, at, one, at one year. And uh, SAE rate, 2.1%, including some perigastric fluid collections. Revision rate of 1.3%. What's new here is he was reversing these endoscopically. So it's nice to show even a year later or so you can reverse this procedure. It might be a nice selling point um, for the tech. And finally, we have a meta-analysis, eight studies, over 1,700 patients. And um, you can see the efficacy here, 16.5% total weight loss at one year and an adverse event rate of 2.2%. Moving on to gastric plication. And this is different than suturing. So instead of mucosa to mucosa, we're plicating serosa to serosa on the backside of the stomach. So we grab tissue with a full thickness tissue grasper, a hollow needle passes through that tissue and it deposits a tissue anchor a distally here, and the needle is withdrawn, the device is opened and another tissue anchor is deployed on the more proximal side here and se secure. So you see this is truly serosa to serosa along the greater curve. We did the first in man work with this many years ago, back 2009, 2008, and um, we got about a 27% excess weight loss. And then they tripled the size of the device and moved to Europe and did some more studies and we're getting much higher results around 60% excess weight loss. And these were uh, uh, uniform across various centers. It's what it looks like a year later, very durable here. This you cannot reverse, unlike with suturing and mucosally based suturing. So this is a uh, randomized sham control trial uh, that was performed in the United States. And you can see the two arms here. Um, we had over 300 patients in this randomized two to one uh, treatment to sham. And unfortunately, this did not meet its endpoints with a total weight loss of nearly 5%. So focusing on the fundus wasn't a great idea. So we've since modified this. And again, this is a report of a first man work looking at uh, placating the body of the stomach instead of the fundus in traditional pose. We work on the body in this distal pose technique, pose 2.0 is various things you can call this. And um, uh, with, this with this procedure, we're getting much better results, 15% uh, total weight loss. And uh, we have more people achieving those results as well. So larger studies underway uh, for this technique. Moving on to aspiration therapy. So this is uh, uh, what looks like a peg tube and a long fenestrated drain that runs up into the fundus. And a half hour after eating, someone will lavage the remaining food out of their stomach. So this is a randomized 
control trial um, and uh, two to one randomization again, comparing um, aspiration therapy with lifestyle to just lifestyle therapy alone. And uh, the BMIs here come up to 55. So this was meant for people suffering with uh, higher stages of obesity. So this was successfully placed in uh, 111 of the 113 patients. Um, and uh, most patients went home the same, well tolerated. Looking at their co-primary endpoints, uh, the first one is uh, uh, percent excess weight loss above the uh, control group. And you can see here in the intensity analysis and the completers, they clearly met that with over 30% excess weight loss compared to a much lower number in the, in the control group. Additionally, there was at least a 50% responder rate uh, based on a 25% excess weight loss cutoff in both the intention treatment analysis and the completers analysis and much better than the, the control in purple. The longer you use this device, the more weight you lose as seen here. It doesn't seem to plateau off, which is encouraging. Uh, and you see this out to four years in a follow-up study where uh, patients are at nearly 19% total weight loss. In adverse events, uh, the main thing you worry about are persistent fistula, which we're seeing in 12% of people and 2% required surgery. So very important to be aggressive when you remove tubes that have been in for a longer period of time by ablating that mucosa and, and uh, clipping or suturing that defect closed to try to minimize the patients that need surgery. Moving on to small bowel type devices. And uh, again, these have a stronger metabolic effect. And uh, first we have the duodenal jejunal bypass liner or endo barrier. And you can see here, it's trying to replicate a Roux-en-Y gastric bypass. Um, the duodenum is sheltered from seeing any food or any mixing of food in the bile as you uh, similarly bypass the duodenum and Roux-en-Y gastric bypass. And this is thought to downregulate uh, anti incretin signaling. Okay, and then you also have food and bile unmixed hitting distal parts of the small bowel more quickly, similar to what you see in the rulin where you augment or upregulate the incretin signaling. So it's thought to have all sorts of positive effects on insulin and glucose homeostasis as well. So here is an example of how the liner is placed. It's very uh, straightforward over a wire under fluoroscopic guidance placed into the small bowel. Uh, the newer device is quite easy to place. We placed one recently and it seems to go in rather smoothly. You do need fluoroscopy. And this was a meta-analysis looking at HbA1c decrease and it was reduced by 1.3% across this cohort of patients suffering from obesity and diabetes. So it's important that both those uh, criteria are met. Additionally, the patients had substantial weight loss, 19% total weight loss. So this is a very interesting device. It was associated with hepatic abscess formation in earlier U.S. clinical trials, and now it's back under study in the U.S., and so far we have not had any uh, return of these um, uh, liver abscesses in the new protocol. Moving on to duodenal mucosal resurfacing. Uh, here we, again, under fluoroscopic guidance, advance a catheter into the small bowel. And this catheter actually uh, has a balloon which expands to push these channels against the small bowel. And then those channels aspirate tissue into them and little needles are advanced, injecting a cushion of fluid to protect the pancreas and deeper structures. And then that balloon is heated up and it ablates the mucosa. And here you see um, the little channel the tissue is aspirated into and the needles advanced and uh, you get your cushion and then ablate that mucosa. So this really does not have any, um, any hindgut effects, but it does uh, attempt to ablate this mucosa, kind of simulating a foregut effect or downregulating anti-incretins, but that's a simplification. It's more complicated than that. I think it's resetting some stem cell activity. So these are results of a single center a uh, study, single arm here as well. Type, all patients had type 2 diabetes. There's 44 of them. They did short segment ablations and longer segment ablations. And the baseline patient characteristics are seen here. Uh, you can see BMI of, of uh, nearly 31, so not terribly obese, but with very poorly controlled diabetes, HbA1c of 9.5. And you can see that that A1c dropped by 1.2%. Uh, at six months across the full cohort, and it was maintained even after mucosal healing was confirmed on biopsies. So something uh, more durable is happening there. 
Additionally, if you look at only patients on stable background medications, so not say on sulfonylureas, which have to be adjusted, but maybe on metformin or something like that, they had a, a greater drop in A1C of 1.8% across that group. Now, the Revita study was interesting, very similar kind of baseline patient characteristics, and also you had a similar drop in HbA1c, but they saw also improvements in liver tests, HOMA IR, and some other metrics. But what's very interesting here is the MR hepatic fat fraction, there was a 30% lowering of relative fat and a 6% reduction of absolute fat. So maybe we have a solution here for NAFLD and NASH as well. And finally, enteral diversion. This is using magnetic anastomosis. So you can see here it requires two endoscopes, one passed from below above the IC valve and one passed from above beyond the uh, ligament of trites. And then the magnets are passed from the channel in the endoscope here and they are coupled under a fluoroscopic guidance. So this forms a treatment path where food can quickly go from the proximal bowel to the distal bowel, but also a preserved native path to mitigate against complications as food can go the traditional longer route. And this only really has hindgut effects. We're augmenting incretin signaling, but we're not really doing anything to that proximal small bowel. These are results of a pilot study uh, looking at the dual path enteral bypass. 10 patients, three were pre-diabetic, four diabetic, had laparoscopic supervision with this as well. And you can see uh, diabetic patients, the A1C dropped from 7.8 down to 6, and the pre-diabetics dropped from about 6.1 down to 5.2-ish. And there was also about a 14% uh, total weight loss here. And this is three years, so good durable outcomes. Additionally, we mentioned uh, NAFLD and NASH a few times. This is a meta-analysis from our group looking at the effect of all BMT, EBMTs across the board on on liver disease. And we found 18 studies that looked at this, uh, including balloons and suturing and whatnot. And uh, there were 863 patients total. And across all these different technologies, they got about a 14.5% total weight loss at the six month mark that they were looking at. And um, primary outcome here in this meta-analysis was liver fibrosis. We found four studies with 162 patients looking at this. And uh, fibrosis, uh, was reduced by a standard mean difference of 0.7 across these studies. And secondary outcomes such as ALT, hepatic steatosis, and uh, uh, histologic NAFLD D activity score all improved statistically significant as well. And uh, the grade uh, methodology looking at this did show that the quality of evidence was low to very low for these studies. So summing it all up here, we have a full spectrum of therapy with bariatric endoscopy, with balloons giving about a 10% total weight loss at a year, ESG and, and POSE getting 15 to 20%, aspiration therapy at 15 to 20% or so as well, fitting nicely under surgery and above medications uh, and across a broad group of patients. In conclusion, EBMTs are proving to be effective and have an increasingly important role in the treatment of obesity. EBMTs also may hold promise in the treatment of type 2 diabetes and across the spectrum of fatty liver disease. And combination therapies and personalized treatment programs, I believe, are now the keys to future success. Thank you for your attention.